right, I'm going to get this started here. Um, go ahead and turn to Acts 2. I'll do this one here. I know Dad said he's going to leave after the service, so I figured this one here would be one that he would be more interested in and more helpful to him. And um, I did the, the last one I did on this was called Why I Hate Pentecostalism and, and You Should Too. And this is part two of that series. And uh, the title's kind of tongue-in-cheek on purpose. You know, it's meant to be kind of provocative. But it's also honest. And I read you that verse of scripture from the Psalms last week. Uh, you know, I hate every false way. I hate every false doctrine. I love the truth. Uh, you know, therefore, I hate every false way. And I'll go ahead and tell you, as we work our way through these doctrines, Lord willing, you're going to see why it's so bad. You're going to see why Pentecostal doctrine is so bad and so dangerous. And, you know, again, I, I make the caveat, and I want people to understand that would ever hear this, I don't hate Pentecostal people. I'm not saying every one of them is guaranteed unsaved. What I am saying is a lot of their doctrine is really bad. And a lot of it is flat out heretical. And I think a lot of people who are in Pentecostal churches are not saved. And we'll see why as this series continues. And it's not, I don't say those things to be mean. I say those things just to be honest. I was talking to a guy at work recently and um, I was telling him, you know, I uh, forget what we were talking about, but I, I just mentioned, you know, a lot of people these days, tolerance, tolerating things is the new number one virtue. It, it's like if you just put up with anything, and I think what we were talking about is the definition of bigot. Uh, a bigot is someone who is intolerant of certain views. Does that, does that qualify you? I hope it does. I hope you don't tolerate certain views or things that people do. Because, you know, nowadays we got drag time, uh, drag queen story time for kids in libraries. Are you tolerant of that? I'm not. People, you can watch these videos. They have to bleep out parts of it because there's nudity shown in these libraries to young children. It's, it's so abominable. It's not even funny. It's gross. It's sickening. And it's almost a shame for me to even mention such a thing. But that's going on in 2020 America. Are you tolerant of that? I'm not. That kind of stuff needs to be put to an end yesterday and so i'm bigoted toward that right but the number one virtue in our society today is tolerance tolerate that tolerate this put up with that well guess what jesus jumped on to some churches in revelation for putting up with false doctrine holders for putting up with a false jezebel woman teaching and you don't you don't tolerate evil you love the good people you love the good the bible says and hate the evil and so hate means to disdain, to disapprove, to, you know, you, you put it down, you put it away, you, you don't cleave to it. And when it comes to Pentecostal doctrine, a lot of it is awful. And I hate it. I hate their doctrine. It's dangerous. And I think nowadays people all, you know, everybody just love and get along. And, but see, the Bible doesn't allow for love to the uh, sacrifice of truth. It's love in the truth. You can't worship God in error. Those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth, John 4 says. That's what Jesus said to the woman at the well. Uh, God is seeking such worshipers. And so as we work our way through the Pentecostal doctrines, I want you to understand I'm not against the people. I'm for the people in these churches. And a lot of people don't understand that when you start preaching against things like this or preaching harder against things or saying things more directly. I am for Pentecostal people. That's why I tell them they're in error. If I hated a Pentecostal person, a charismatic person or something, if I hated that person, I would never tell them any different. I could love myself and desire their affection, desire their friendship, desire their approval, and just never correct them. And they would like me. But since I care about them, I try to correct them and lead them to the truth. And so our society has it backwards. If you try to correct somebody, you're evil and you're mean. But really, that's an act of love and care to show them the truth. And our society has just flipped it on its head. It's demonic is what it is. It's satanic. Now, um, all that said, I want to kind of introduce the topic today. Uh, again, why I hate Pentecostalism, and you should too. This one and the next one, Lord willing, will be on the doctrine of tongues. Okay, and there's multiple different things I want to hit on the doctrine, and 
uh, of tongues, as charismatics would call it. Tongues is a word that just means languages. That's what tongues means. Uh, but as we go through this uh, short series here, we're going to see that they don't think that it just means languages. But um, as an introduction, if I was to ask you, you know, what would you say is the identifying act or practice or activity of a Christian? Well, you know, or how about this? When you think of Christianity, what do you think about? If I asked you that question, what would you say? What would come to your mind? I mean, some people say, oh, you know, maybe going to church or something, or some people say, you know, prayer or uh, maybe evangelism or Bible study or fellowship. But, you know, there's never uh, somebody that's going to answer those things in a charismatic church, I don't believe. Very rarely. For those raised in a Pentecostal church, their their answer probably would be tongues. The gift of tongues. What do you think of when you think of Christianity? Tongue speaking. That's probably what some of them would say, or music. The doctrine of, the, or the, the gift of tongues is what they call it. You know, it, it's, it's something big in these Pentecostal churches. And there's a lot of confusion on it, which is the purpose of these next couple sermons I'm doing here. And just to question the validity of the act of these people speaking in gibberish, to say gibberish like I just now did is offensive to some of them. And it, to question the validity of, that that might not be from God, they get really offended, super offended. Uh, I can't count how many times in evangelism, I remember one specific one pops in my mind from Kansas City. Uh, we was out on a, like one of those kind of like out in the, in the hood, you know, like witnessing. I remember speaking to this woman. I couldn't give her the gospel. I couldn't get it out of my mouth. She would not shut up about tongues. I don't know why. It's like I said the word God, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I speak in tongues. And I couldn't get her off of it. I could not move the conversation anywhere else. She just wanted to talk about tongues. Tongues, to some people, becomes their entire experience or the entire thing they're trying to experience in Christianity. It's so weird. So strange. And a lot of people claim to experience these things. A lot of people claim that they've had this kind of experience. And, you know, they, they'll, they'll say, well, what about this? What do you say about this? I had a guy, uh, I'll say his name's Mike. I had a guy one time tell me his, his story was he walked an aisle in a church. He walked an aisle and he just remember in his head he heard, he heard some language in his head. He heard, an, uh, you know, something in his head speak to him or something. And, uh, you know, the way he put it out there was like it was like tongues in his head. All right. This guy wasn't saved, by the way. If you asked him if he was a Christian, he literally said no. But So what was that then? Please tell me, what was that? You see, because they always put the burden of proof on the person questioning the validity of tongues. Oh, you say I didn't speak in tongues? You saying that ain't right? Well, you tell me, what was it that gibberish in this man's, in this man's head... If he's not saved. That makes no sense whatsoever. I know another guy named Mark. Mark told me one time after church one night. He told me a story about how in the middle of the night. He sprang out of bed like a board. Just sprang straight up. Imagine that. You know what I mean? Like a, if you, you know how you step on a board that's hanging over something. And it's just like, like that. Sprang straight up was the way he described it. And started speaking in tongues in his bedroom. Just to himself, I guess. What is the purpose of that? Why would that happen? Why would God do that? What is this? This is what Pentecostals say all the time. And I've heard of stories of large gatherings of people that will meet early in the morning to study the Bible. No, not like we did this morning. To worship God in simplicity and truth. No, to offer up prayers. No. Not even to fellowship. To go to the altar of the church. To get on their knees. And to seek tongues. Oh God please give me tongues. I just want to speak in tongues. Would you please give me tongues Lord. Oh I just want tongues. And they sit there. 
And they want God to let them speak in a babelish language. That's what it sounds like when you hear them talking. They seek that out. And if they don't get that gift, they call it, you know, they got to keep seeking it. And they'll twist verses like, yeah, I'm earnestly seeking a good gift. And I've talked to some Pentecostals, they feel down. And they're like, well, you know, I've not spoken tongues yet. You know, it's almost like they feel like God's holding something back from them. Like, God ain't gave me that gift yet. I'm, I'm trying to get that gift. There's a lot of confusion around this. And, uh, you know, I could give you examples, and I could literally just keep giving you a list of this, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. In, in, in Pentecostal churches all over, you have a mixture of people with the gift and without the gift. And I want you to get this point that I'm trying to make. This is one of the dangers of Pentecostalism with a true Christian. This is one of the things that make me hate Pentecostal doctrine. You say, why do you hate it? That's a strong word. Let me tell you this. When you have a Christian, when you have a Christian who's being told God is holding back from you. He gave it to me, but he ain't giving it to you. That makes me sick. That makes me sick. As a father with three boys, I can't imagine sitting here and just going to one of my boys and just giving them some special gift and saying, ha ha ha, you other two ain't getting it. That would be horrible. But that's what these charismatics are effectively saying when they say, I got the gift. Did you? You better seek it. He gave it to me. It is wicked at its core. It makes people feel horrible. It makes them feel sub-Christian. It makes them feel unloved. It makes them feel not special. It makes them feel like they're not meeting the mark. In some way, they're told to seek the gift. They need to have more faith. They need to do better in some way. And some, uh, some are told that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Spirit. Some say that tongues is the evidence that you got the Spirit in the first place. And what I want to do is I want to kind of look at all these different uh, abnormalities and abominations of doctrine in regards to the do doctrine of tongues. And I want to just like make it real easy and simple for us to understand what tongues is and show why it's so wicked and stupid what Pentecostals have done with this doctrine. So if you're in Acts 2, I'm going to start reading from there. But what I want to make sure we understand today, I want to focus on tongues as evidence of salvation or evidence of a second blessing, receiving of the Spirit. This is a Pentecostal doctrine. Really, if I was to list out the ones that I hate the most, this is right up there. Right alongside losing salvation, this one right is right up there. To try to say that having the gift of quote-unquote tongues is somehow evidence that you receive the Spirit of God. And they twist Scripture and they try to pretend like that's something you know that's true in Scripture or something like that. And that's why some people say, oh, well, you don't have a spirit. I had a woman ask me that on the bus. I mentioned it last week. Oh, you've never spoken tongues? Well, I guess you ain't got the Spirit in. This is one of the things that makes Christians that are taught this uh, abominable doctrine, Christians are like, why don't God love me enough to give me that? Why don't God gift me with that? Maybe I'm not good enough for that. Maybe I'm missing out on something. Maybe I need to be better and do gooder. That's not godly. That's not biblical. And that, I think that that's horrific doctrine. It's, it's doctrine from the devil that's meant to scar and, and to lash out at Christians, to beat the people of God and to make them feel bad about themselves. And I'll tell you what, just to be honest with you, you know, believe it or not, I actually think a lot of the actual ooga booga dooga, uh, what was that woman? I watched a woman bounce around on YouTube. Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, my, 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 my. That's all she kept saying. And she acting like she was gibberish and in tongues. I think a lot of that is of the devil. You say, well, I ain't no spirit causing that. Uh, you're, there's a spirit causing that, you say. Well, yeah, maybe. Maybe a demonic one. Maybe a demonic one. Maybe some of them are just making it up. Maybe some of them like, oh, my, 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 my. I have a strong feeling that uh, Miss Oh, my, 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 my was bouncing around on her own free will. I don't think a demon was making her say, oh, my, 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 my. I think that was just her very generic, <laughs> very, very poorly done fake tongues. And I think a lot of people learn how to fake it. They learn how to do it. Did you know? 
I'm telling you the truth. Did you know? I've seen it. Cartoon uh, uh, coloring book things for kids in Pentecostal charismatic churches that have bubbles above their head saying, Timmy don't know what he's saying. And it's teaching kids to speak in, in gibberish. Teaching them that tongues is some, you know, gibberish, gobbledy junk that, like, you don't really know what it is. I'm here to tell you that's not what the Bible says tongues is. I'll prove that in due time, Lord willing. But today, I want to focus on, is tongues evidence of salvation? And is tongues evidence of receiving the Spirit of God? Absolutely not. What a dumb doctrine. So unbiblical, it ain't funny. And yeah, a lot of people believe this junk. So let me show you why I didn't. Let me, I'm going to kind of cover this as best I can. Uh, look, in, look in Acts 2. I'm just going just gonna to throw this out here first. One of, the, one of the number one places. You say, where do Pentecostals pull, pull their name from? Right here. Right here. And it's very evident of what they're all about. They, they call themselves Pentecostals because they focus on the gift of tongues primarily and the sign gifts that were given to the apostles and prophets in the early church. And they, so they call themselves, we're Pentecostals. We're all about like, it's like a Pentecost every day, man. It was just gifts and miracles. Woo, miracles everywhere. Miracles for everybody. And yet everybody's still sick and dying around them. And yet we never see them speaking foreign languages on demand anywhere, only gibberish. And yet they live wicked lives and they're un really, really unchanged and they don't really study the Bible. But it's just a Pentecost every day. Woo, Pentecost every Sunday. We're Pentecostals. Well, this is where they get it from. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, they were, and, there, uh, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Because that every man, listen to this, every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these speak, uh, all these speaking Galatians? Uh, it says, are not all these which speak Gala uh, Galileans? And now, and how hear every man in his own tongue, wherein we were born? Now watch this. How many different kinds of people and languages are there? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phag uh, Phrygia and uh, Pamphylia, and in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and the strangers of Rome, and Jews, and proselytes. All these different people had gathered. They were effectively Jews. They were adhering to the Jewish religion. <clears throat> they believed in God the Father. They were there for Passover. They were, uh, you know, observing, just like people would observe uh, uh, Easter or Christmas and come to church that day. They were going there for Pentecost. They were believers in God, but they were from these diverse areas gathered together. And they were hearing the preaching from these people gathered in their own language. You get that? They didn't hear, oh, shubaga, baga, booga, booga, ma, 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 ma. They didn't hear that. They heard their language. Now, if you heard someone speak Chinese, and you heard someone speak English. Let's say two people got up and one started speaking to me in English and one started speaking to me in Chinese. I'd say, I hear him in my language. I don't understand that. That's what you got here. Some people are saying, I hear these people speaking in my language. What's going on? Aren't they from Galilee? And other people are like, that's a weird language. What is that? They drunk? And what was going on? They were hearing what they were hearing preaching in their language. It's like they had, you ever seen a preacher get up and they have an interpreter right beside them and they'll say one sentence and then the interpreter will preach a sentence. It happens. That's what they do on the missions field a lot of times. Uh, they, they will do that on the fly, literal interpretation and translation uh, on the fly. 
It's like that, but all at once with different people preaching the message to these people. It's not complex, man. This ain't confusing. It's simple. Tongues is a language. Tongues is languages. That's what it is. And it says that they were preaching the wonderful works of God. Um, look at verse 12 now. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to one another, What meaneth this? And some people started mocking them, saying, oh, I don't understand what they're saying. That's a different language than mine, you know. These people, they're drunk or something. And Peter got up. He took the opportunity after that. And he decided to say, you know what? I'm going to preach. And he used that opportunity to preach to these people. Now, Pentecostals, at least some of them, I won't say all of them, you can't blanket everybody to believe everything. There's different denominations within charismaticism. There's different fringe churches that refuse to believe the same way. But in general, there's a lot of Pentecostals who will say that if you receive the Spirit of God, then, then you will manifest it by speaking in tongues. It's, a, it's one of the number one doctrines that they have. And they will use Acts chapter 2 and a couple other places to show that. Now, here's what I want to prove to you. I want to show you something, okay? Is that true? If you receive the Spirit of God, will you speak in tongues? Is that true? And they'll say, well, look, they received the Spirit of God in Acts 2, and they spoke in tongues. Promises to them and everybody far off. And they'll twist what Peter said later on. He was talking about salvation later on in the sermon. And I heard a preacher in Gate City about uh, 10 years ago. I remember laying in bed, watching it in, in bed uh, when I used to live over uh, at the first house we lived in over. I remember laying in bed, a preacher in Weber City or Gate City or something. Promises to you and to those that are far off. He said it like a dozen times. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Where are you going with this? Tongues. Tongues. Not about salvation, which is what it's talking about. If you keep reading, you'll figure out if you don't understand what I'm saying. Peter says the promise is to you and to those who are far off. Everybody can be saved. Everybody's called to salvation. If you believe on Christ, you will be saved. And they say, no, that's about tongues. That's another demonic thing that Pentecostals do is they make everything about sign gifts or make everything about tongues. But let me, let me get to this. Is it true? Follow with me, please. I'm going to go through the book of Acts. It'll take you just a few moments to catch up with me each time. I'm going to show you some things in the book of Acts here. And I'm going to show you when people are saved in the book of Acts, they don't speak in tongues every time. Okay? They don't. Now, the Spirit of God, listen to this, the Spirit of God came to indwell believers at Pentecost. Right? Jesus himself said, he has been with you, he will be in you, okay? And the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is in the Old Testament, and I might mention this later, the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not dwell in every believer. He would come upon some people and he'd leave. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. And that began at Pentecost, okay? Now get this. Now, I could have wrote something on the board that would help you visually see this, but maybe I will after the sermon. Now, now get this. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has now came down to indwell the church that began at Pentecost. That's what I believe the church began at Pentecost. Other people say it began in Acts 9, and other people believe it began you know, somewhere in the gospel accounts. I believe the church was founded and effectively began at Pentecost. That's what I believe. And so in Acts 2, the church is officially founded by the indwelling of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is here to indwell believers now. Now watch, when you're saved, do you speak in tongues? Because the Spirit of God's here now. Pentecost has happened. Look in Acts 2, verse 36. Follow along with me if you can. And I'll show you this. Very simple. Therefore, this is the end of uh, Peter's sermon. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They expressed belief. They believed the message. Okay? And I actually believe at this point they're saved. When, when you say to me, when I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I say, Jesus died for your sins. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he came and was born of a virgin. He lived the perfect life, and he died on the cross for your sins, and he, he rose again. And you say, oh, no, I, I believe that. What do I need to do? Guess what? You're expressing 
faith in that, and you're, you're, you're saved then. All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord at that point, right? And I believe what Peter is saying is in light of their faith, he tells them to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I think for there means because of. Because of the remission of sins. Since you know, you're know you going to receive remission of sins for faith in Jesus, he says, then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, and as many as the Lord God, our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. I think, I think Calvinist heads just exploded. I'll read it again here. Save yourselves, Peter told him. Now, Peter must have been a Pelagian. Uh, Peter, Peter must not have understood the anthropology because he told them to save themselves. But anyways, I'm just being sarcastic and funny. Verse 41, when they, when they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they all spoke in tongues. Oh, wait, did it say, did it say anything about them tongues? In? No. But how many people got saved? 3,000. Now turn to Acts 13. I can show you more. I just I have my own handful of I've chose here just to prove the point. Go to Acts 13, verse 48. I'll give you a second to get there. Acts 13, verse 48. Pentecost has happened. We're in the New Testament uh, church age. The Holy Spirit has came to indwell believers. People are getting saved. Are they speaking in tongues once they get saved? Acts 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And then they spoke in tongues. Nope, not there. They just got saved. And, and by the way, when it says ordained to eternal life believed, I believe that it's disposed. As many as has appointed themselves or as was disposed to eternal life believed. And that's another sermon for another day. Go to Acts 16, verse 30. We're just looking at people getting saved in the book of Acts after Pentecost. Pentecostals propose, when you get saved, you get the gift of tongues. When you get the Spirit of God, you get the gift of tongues. It's evidenced by tongues. Well, really? Let's find out if that's what the Bible says. Acts 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And what he's saying is, hey, you believe on the Lord and you'll be saved and everybody in your house, same way of salvation for them. It's the same way for me to be saved. It's the same way for you to be saved and you to be saved and my kids to be saved. There ain't a different way of salvation for anybody. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him as your savior. Call in the name of the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that your son died for my sins. And... You're saved. That's what the Bible says. I know a lot of people got a problem with that. And they want people to do works. And they want people to quit sins. But the Bible says it's by faith alone. That's what it says here. Verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. And all, all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night. And washed their stripes and was baptized. And all his straightway. They got saved. They believed on Jesus. And then they got baptized, not a word about speaking in tongues at all. Go to Acts 17, mine's right there on the next, next page, 17 verse 4. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout uh, Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. A bunch of people get saved, not a word about speaking in tongues. Verse 12 of the same chapter 17, therefore many of them believed. Also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, and not a few. Not a word about tongues. It's, uh, verse 34 in, in Acts 17. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among which was Dion, Dionysus and Aeropagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Not a word about speaking in tongues. Bunch of people getting saved. Not a word. Thousands and thousands have been saved in Acts by now. Not a word about them speaking in tongues. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Not a single word about speaking in tongues. And someone might say, well, what does that matter? Why are you talking about, you know, 
getting saved, that ain't what they're talking. When a when a charismatic Pentecostal says, you know, they believe you need the Spirit of God, and, and the Spirit of God's evidence is you speak in tongues. If you get the Spirit of God, you know, you'll speak in tongues. You're saying when you get saved, you're messing it up. You don't understand. And let me explain this to you if you don't follow me so far. Some Pentecostal charismatic teachers will tell you that you can be saved. Over here is a saved person, okay? Saved person A. This person, according to some of these Pentecostals, not all of them, this is, a, this is a core doctrine to a lot of them, though. They will say, person A, right here, is a saved person, but they have not received the Holy Spirit. That's stupid. Unbiblical. But that's what some of them say. Then they say, person B here has attained. He's arrived. They got the gift. They got the Spirit of God. They got the second blessing. And that's evidence because they spoke in tongues. That's what some of them teach. And that's why that woman on the MEOC bus said, I must be person A. Oh, I'm just a poor old little, little baby Christian. I don't got the Spirit yet. I got to go here and reach level two Christian. And I'll get the Spirit in. Do you see how destructive that is if you think about it? Now here's the key. Is that even biblical? That's all I care about. Now if that was true biblically, we'd have to deal with it, wouldn't we? And I'd tell you this morning, guys, you guys better get on board. You guys better step it up a notch if you ain't spoken tongues yet, you know? Is that true though? No, it's not. Ephesians chapter 1. You don't have to go there. Just listen. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, okay? Talking about salvation, talking about how if you first trust in Christ, you're going to be predestined to all these great things. Verse 13 of Ephesians 1 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You get that? After ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14 says, Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And earnest there... The word means a down payment or a guarantee. And I've said this before. It's like if I wanted to buy a house off dad and I went to him, I said, here's 10 grand out of the 30. That would be an earnest. Like, you know, and who in the world would give 10 grand and not intend to buy the thing, right? Well, how much more would God give his Holy Spirit to you and you not go to heaven? How much more silly would that be? And that's what the Bible's saying. You have received the Holy Spirit of God. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you by faith upon salvation. And that is proof, that is God's down payment to you, that you're going to heaven. That you're predestined to all these glorious things. That's the proof of it. Now, think of how wicked it is for a Pentecostal charismatic to say, you don't got the Holy Spirit yet, you poor old thing. You need to speak in tongues. Well, hold on a second. This says everybody who believes is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, let me go further with this. Let me show you a few more things. I'm going to 2 Corinthians 13. Again, you don't got to turn there. Just for sake of time, just listen. At the end of the book of 2 Corinthians, this is the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And at the very end of that second letter, after all his teaching and all his rebukes and all his exhortations and all his warnings and all this teaching about Jesus, he says to these people, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. He says, do you not know that God is in you? And all times the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. And it's, I don't mean that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. It speaks to their unity. It speaks to how they're all God. All three persons of the Trinity are God, right? He says, hey, do you not realize that, that God is in you? 
If, and then what he's saying by implication is, if, if God is not in you, you're not saved. You get that? And he's telling them even further, if God ain't in you by now, you might be a reprobate. Which is another, another doctrine and another sermon for another time. But do you see now? Can you follow? You see how easy this is to discern? Over here in Ephesians. After you believe, you're given the Holy Spirit as a down payment, a promise of eternal redemption. Over here in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Hey, do you not realize if Jesus ain't in you, then, then you might be a reprobate? You might not, you might not be saved? And these people will tell you, you ain't got the gift yet. Now, if you ain't got the Holy Spirit in this dispensation, if you ain't got the Holy Spirit in the church age, you ain't saved. If you ain't got the Holy Spirit, you ain't saved. It's what Ephesians 1.13 says. It's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13. It's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12. Listen to this. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus, Christ, uh, Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. No one's going to live under the Lordship of Christ without Jesus Christ, you know, the, or the Holy Spirit leading them. No, I don't believe anybody can be saved just of their own volition without the Spirit working on them. And, and yet you would have all these people, these charismatic Pentecostals would have you believe that totally without the Holy Spirit in you, here you are over here as this Christian, no Spirit of God, nothing. But the Bible says He's your down payment, promise of redemption. If you don't have Him in you, you're not saved. You know, if you don't have Him in you, you can't even profess Christ. What on earth? If God ain't working on you or He's not in you, you can't even profess Jesus. But Pentecostals, and Charismatics want to tell me I need to get tongues to prove I have the Spirit of God. And, you know, I'll go. this actually is a good portion of Scripture to go ahead and read. And I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to, to get through the rest of this. I might have to break this one up, unfortunately. Um, but listen to this. Let me read this to you. It's worth reading. It's worth showing you this if you've never seen this before. If you, hopefully you have, but maybe you've never had it taught to you this, this you know, kind of directly and simply. Let me, let me read to you 1 Corinthians 12. If you want to get there, you can. I'm going to read a lot of it, so it might be beneficial to you to follow along. I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians 12. Proposition of the Charismatics. If you get the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. Not all of them, but some of them tell you that. That's a doctrine they have. I'm, I'm tired of giving that caveat, because I know the first time you try to say that, ah, I don't believe that, you misrepresented me. You know, So I'm just trying to be fair. Not every one of them will tell you that, but a lot of them do. A lot of them do. It's one of the most common heresies that they have. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now there are, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Verse 6. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with him. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that are uh, that are one that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. Do you notice that? Now I want to take a quick break here and just point this out. Do you notice he says dividing to every man severally as he will? In other words, everybody ain't gonna get it. Dividing it up, you know, you might get it, they might not type thing. And he's talking to the early church. I don't think. These days, that the gift of tongues is, is for us today. That's, that's something else for another sermon, probably the second or third in the series. But for now, that's, that's irrelevant. For now, that's not what I'm arguing at all. Let's say you think tongues is for today. Irrelevant to this conversation. Let's, let's continue. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that, of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And now what he's going to do, he's going to give you this illustration, okay? And he's going to show you how the church, the local church, is built by God in such a way where everybody is not the same. He gifts people within a local assembly with various gifts so that ministry and work can be done. Everybody in the church ain't going to be a teacher. Everybody in the church ain't going to have the same level of faith. Everybody in the church ain't going to be able to give the same amount. Everybody in the church ain't going to be able to do the same things the same way. There's diverse gifts, and the Holy Spirit operating in each person works it out that way so that you have everything that you need. And there's not one guy running around like Pastor Duffy with electricity and a handshake with all the gifts. I got it all. I'm Mega Man up here with all the gifts. No, that's called Jesus, who had all the gifts, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, right? He had all gifts of the Holy Spirit. He was fully God, right? We're not God. We don't have 100% of all the gifts. That His name's Jesus. That's, that's who has all those. He's divine. He's God in the flesh. We are not that. All right, look back here with me. Watch this illustration he gives in verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? In other words, some guy is a foot. He says, well, I'm not a hand, therefore I don't belong. That's like somebody saying, well, I'm a teacher, but I don't speak in tongues, so I must not be a Christian. This is exactly what charismatic Pentecostals who say to have the gift of tongues is evidence of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what they're saying. Well, I guess I'm not a Christian then if I don't speak in tongues. That's what someone would tell you, that you wasn't saved unless you speak in tongues. They're directly countered by this, this chapter. That's what I'm trying to show you. Just because you don't have the same spiritual gift, don't make you any lesser or greater than anybody else. And if some people look at that like a preacher is better than other people. That's not true at all. That's not true at all. In fact, I think most preachers or many preachers will be less rewarded than many people sitting in pews. And many moms that, that raise kids in a godly way. I mean, many preachers, do you know the Bible says we have a stricter judgment? Did you know that I have a stricter judgment before God than, than you will for teaching? That's a big load. That's one of the reasons why I study so hard and I put so much into this. And it, it's like something I've always just been, you have to either be married to it or divorced from it. It's not halfway in when it comes to studying and knowing the Bible. I'm going to be judged based on what I teach people. But just because you're not teaching don't mean you're not going to be rewarded. Doesn't mean you're a lesser Christian. And that goes with all the gifts. You see? Just because I can't give as much money or time or energy to one thing as someone else does, don't make them a better Christian than me. Who made one to differ from another? God. That's what the Bible said. God is the one di di setting up these things divisively. And so you get this, you get this, this is how you're special. And everybody comes together and serves God with the gifts that they're given. Can Pentecostal charismatics, no, 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 no. Everybody needs to speak in tongues or you don't got the spirit of God. You see how, how horrific that is? That's very dangerous. Now let me follow this out here and I'll close. He says in verse 17, If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing... Where were the smelling? And I'll, I'll interject this here before I read verse 18. If everybody was a teacher, who's going to be taught? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What are we going to do to sit here and teach each other? We're all teachers. You see? It, it, I mean, that's just the way that it is, man. Everybody ain't going to be the same. If everybody was rich, what would giving matter? We wouldn't need nobody to give. If, if nobody needed help, what would it be for good for God making it where you can help people? Nobody needs help. You know, and so there's these diverse situations and diverse gifts that are brought upon by God to enable you to be blessed by God. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. And if it were all, uh, all one member, where were the body? But now are there many members yet but one body? And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, 
Much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. You see that? What he's saying? And now, here's what he's saying. Like the preacher, the, the person who's gifted with preaching, or the person who gives a lot of money, they may seem like indisposable. And that's the way churches a lot of times treat these people. Oh, they're a big tither. Don't let them go. I've seen that said, man. Oh, they give a lot. Don't let them go. Or, oh, that preacher is so good. If he wasn't here, the church wouldn't make it. But you know what? That little old lady sitting in the back row in the back pew that comes in and blesses everybody in the church and everybody's glad to see them and the fellowship that some of the people give some of the people in the church and the conversations they have and just the, just the kind words maybe that they give. Each one of those people that wind up making up a local assembly are so crucial and important to that local assembly that in fact, if you took them away, it would hurt that church more than if you took the preacher away. That's what the Bible's basically saying. The ones that seem to be more feeble, they're necessary. And so what makes sense in our fleshly mind, well, I don't give enough, I don't do enough. Well, you just be you. You just love the Lord. You study the Bible. You come to church. You do your part. You do what God's leading you to do. You love people how God leads you to do. And guess what? It might seem to you that it's more feeble or unnecessary, but God says that's directly necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members will suffer with it, or one member to be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now get this, here, here we go. Now ye are all the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now watch this. He just listed some random gifts. He said, you know what? God, God did pick some apostles. You know what? God did, did pick some uh, prophets. And you know what? Some people are going to be teachers. And some people are going to have these miraculous gifts, he said. Some people are going to have the gifts of healings or miracles or governments or tongues. But what, watch what he does in verse 29. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? You know, this is rhetorical. Of course not. Of course not. That's what he's saying. The whole thing he's been saying the whole time is, you're not all the same. And so he's given a rhetorical, a sarcastic ending to this chapter. Is everybody an apostle? Is everybody a prophet? Is everybody a teacher? Does everybody work miracles? Have all the gifts of healings? And get this. Do all speak with tongues? Well, if you don't speak with tongues, you don't got the Holy Spirit. Well, hold on a second. Paul said not everybody's going to speak in tongues. Paul said that the Spirit of God is giving out gifts in a diverse, divisive way. So we have in Ephesians 1 and in 2 Corinthians and in 1 Corinthians, we have the Bible repeatedly saying, when you're saved, you receive the Spirit of God. He's a down payment, the promise of your eternal redemption. We see in the book of Acts, people getting saved and getting saved and getting saved and getting saved and none of them are speaking in tongues. And then we see in Corinthians uh, chapter 12, that the Bible explicitly says not everybody's going to speak in tongues. And yet, still there's this charismatic doctrine out there that says if you get the Holy Spirit, you'll speak in tongues. Does that not seem really dumb to you now? I mean, I, I hope that I've taught this well enough. Do you not see how bad that doctrine is? How unbiblical that doctrine is? To say that and some of them would go farther than just saying it's a second blessing of a saved person. Like some secondary experience a saved person has. They get the Spirit of God and get tongues. Some go further than that and say, if you get saved, you speak in tongues. So that's the entry level for salvation. You ain't tongues, you're not even saved. You see, this teaching is horrifying to anybody who, who loves God's Word. It's destructive. It's heresy. It beats true Christians down and makes them feel like they're sub-Christian. 
Do you see why I hate Pentecostal doctrine yet? Hopefully. Hey, man, weeks to come, Lord willing. It, just buckle up. There's much more to come. Pentecostalism's full of this garbage doctrine that beats Christians down, that makes Christians feel like they don't got the Spirit of God, that makes Christians feel like they're not as empowered as other Christians. To say nothing of how it, it mocks the Spirit of God's actual work and have people rolling in the floor like uh, hiking their legs like a dog or, or gibberishing or gyrating or, or uh, babbling or foaming at the mouth or having a stroke or a seizure. or jump, I've seen people jump in baptisms, bouncing around, saying, oh, my, 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 my. They make a mockery of Bible doctrine. They make a mockery of the Holy Spirit. And then they want to get offended because I say I hate their doctrine. They need to be careful. They need to take the warning seriously of, of Paul in 2 Corinthians that said, hey, you need to test yourself is the Holy Spirit actually in you at all? Or is that another spirit? Or is that just you? Is that just your emotions? Is that just your upraising? You need to test yourself. Are you even in the faith? Do you have Christ in you? That's what some of these people need to seriously consider. I'll close there. And I'll continue, Lord willing, uh, next week.